Welcome to Burning Platforms, a podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. I'm Peter Lewis. This episode, we're live from the ALP Fringe Festival in Mianjin, where Digital Rights Watch Chair Lizzie O'Che joined me and Ed Santo, the co-director of the Human Technology Institute, to talk AI policy. And we were joined by our special guest, Labor MP, Jerome Lexal, who submitted himself to a live phone hack. It was a great discussion, and I hope you enjoy it too. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a live burning platforms from the Labor Party's Fringe Festival in Brisbane. My name's Peter Lewis. I'm the director of the Centre for Responsible Technology. Really happy to be up here with my friends, my partner in crime and the chair of Digital Rights Watch, Lizzie O'Shea. Hello, Lizzie. Welcome to Brisbane. Thank you. I love Brisbane. It's lovely to be here. And the great Ed Santo, former Human Rights Commissioner and now the director of the Human Technology Institute. Hi, Ed. G'day. And our special guest, who is going to be the subject to a live phone hack later in the show, Jerome Laxale, the member for Benelong. G'day, Jerome. G'day, I'm petrified. You should be, because I've seen what we've found. Um, all right, so people. I'm signed up to it. I'm out now. Yeah. Check the box. I reckon you've. I reckon your consent was, was, was attained and so here we are. So the normal format of these is that we kick around some key issues in the world of tech and politics and then we do a deep dive. So that's pretty much what we're going to do today. But given that we are at ALP conference and there is actually an AI policy, we thought we might actually do something substantial first, which is Labor's AI policy, which until our good friend Amy Denmead rang me yesterday and said, you know, there is an AI policy, I was going to do this without even knowing that was part of it. But it's interesting. So Labor's policy, is, um, and I'm interested from Jerome about the, the degree of line of sight that you guys get in the development of this stuff as well, because it's, kind of, it's kind of broad and also concerning at the same time. So. I'll just read out the top line. It's using generative AI in ways that benefit Australians. Sounds great. Then it says, recent developments in generative artificial intelligence, i.e. chat GTP, are poised to transform industries across the Australian economy. Labor will ensure that the development of policy in relation to AI both supports the uptakes in ways that benefit Australians, who wouldn't, while introducing guardrails that safeguard Australian communities. And then it sort of goes line by line down about talking about the importance of meaningful, secure jobs, retraining and skills development, which is like the transition um, from technological change. And it keeps going down and down and down. Then we'll get to F. It starts talking about the governance measures almost as an afterthought. Now, I don't know (laughs) if you've read this, Ed. I'm, I'm interested in your take on... The, the policy as it stands, but also about that balance between the opportunity of technology and the risks of it um, in, in a single document. Yeah. Look, I think on paper it's pretty good, right? Like we, we want to see um, the benefits associated with artificial intelligence. We want to see them spread across the community. And we know that we need to have guardrails. And I guess as we've seen um, you know, AIB democratised um, through the rise of ChatGPT, people are playing with it and they can kind of get a bit of a sense as to, you know, how it can be good, how it can be bad. Um, I think the really interesting thing about this moment is you've got big tech companies saying, we want to be regulated. Like, literally, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, the company that is responsible for ChatGPT, he said in US Congress just a couple of months ago, we want regulation. He actually said AI regulation is essential. So we'd all agree with that. The problem is, as soon as you propose a law, he goes, well, not that regulation, not that law, not that law. It, 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 can I just say one last thing about that, right? It reminds me a little bit of this really important moment in our family's history, where my then three-year-old nephew was at a family wedding, and he took this big bowl of chocolates and he locked himself into the, in, the, in the bathroom with the chocolates and just started eating them. And he started crying. He was going, oh, I'm so sick. I can't, <laughs> can't eat all of any more of these chocolates. Take these chocolates. And his Save parents, me from the yeah, chocolates. Exactly. And his parents were going, 
just stop eating the chocolates and unlock the door. And he goes, <laughs> make me stop eating the chocolates. Like that's Sam Altman, right? Like he's like, regulate me, regulate me. Coding, 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 coding. Regulate me, stop me from doing these terrible, terrible things that I'm not going to stop doing. And you kind of go, well, at some point, you actually got to say, no, we need to enforce the existing laws much more effectively than we were already doing, and we need to fill the gaps in the law. So it's a long-winded way of saying is, I think we've got, we've got to a good place with the, with the platform. The hard bit now is to take those really good words and make them real. What do you reckon, Lizzie? Is the horse bolted or is this timely? No, I definitely think the horse hasn't bolted. So there's a huge opportunity here to craft good regulation. I mean, I'm a human rights person, so would have, what I would have liked to see in the policy would be a commitment to human rights in the use and of AI and also its development. Um, I think also that we need to hurry up, to be honest, because Europe is already exploring these issues quite extensively. They've got a different kind of model. It involves looking at the risk associated with the use rather than the technology per se in the abstract, which I think is a is a good way to look at it because you might not mind AI in, in low risk settings. You might not mind it if it's suggesting the end of a text message or something. But then when it comes to, you know, using a profile of a face in a police database, it takes on quite a different hue. And I think thinking about the risk of its deployment is probably a better starting point than just thinking about the technology per se, because I think in the abstract, it doesn't really make make a huge amount of sense mm. to think just about regulation in those terms. So we, I think, need to get our skates on uh, and start regulating quickly so that we can, uh, you know, make some of these decisions. Are we going to follow in the image of what the Europeans are doing? Are we going to think a bit more differently about it or in slightly different ways? Uh, all that's an important kind of st important items to discuss. But um, I don't think it's too late, and I think, in fact, uh, we, but we do need to get our skates on. I would say um, Ed Hesick, obviously, has, in, has put out a discussion paper at, about AI. Yeah. Digital Rights Watch put in a paper to that. I think it was probably a few more questions than I would have liked in the sense that it still seems quite... Uh, How a awesome will this be? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> more like it was just about exploring some of these very difficult questions, and I'm not sure whether, um, uh, you know, it would be good to know that, that some of these policy positions are perhaps being thought about and then are, are taking, being taken out to be tested, and, and, you know, that's fine. I'm happy to be in that exploratory stage. One of the challenges, I think, of this field, though, is that it's spread across a lot of different industries, a lot of different portfolios. We don't really actually have a centralised portfolio for, you know, digital tech, so to speak, and uh, that does mean it's a bit of a challenge, because you, you've got to then convince the right hand to know what the left hand's doing and you know I, I bang on a lot about privacy reform you know we're going to talk about this in a bit but I think actually some of these policy initiatives uh, have to be kind of joined up if we're going to get meaningful regulation of a, of a concept mm -hmm. like AI so it's not a, a single um, issue that the Department of Industry can deal with we're going to have to have lots of cross-cutting kind of uh, policy ideas and discussions to make this effective in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested in your take on what's going on in Hollywood at the moment just because I thought it'd be good to get Hollywood into the the discussion, but there's an amazing strike going on at the moment that is all over the take-up of generative AI in the entertainment industry. So it's, it's being framed through a workers' rights lens. Yeah, like I think it's, of course, fascinating to watch this happen because should creative works, um, should they be able to be automated in their production and then people come in for a last edit, for example, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about in relation to the writer strike. I think a lot of people in workplaces are contending with sophisticated technology already. People who work in supermarkets, in, in fast food chains, people who work in factories, they're obviously contending with sophisticated technical systems of management already. Uh, and unions in those places are also raising these kinds of questions, which I think is great. I absolutely think we should have labour in these discussions because these are um, people who are experiencing the pointy ends of some of these technologies. They don't always have rights to kind of buttress them and protect them from the deployment of these systems. And they're great people to talk to about how mm. they can be used effectively, uh, but also make work meaningful, not something that's complete drudgery and that is respectful of people's rights. Mm. I might bring Jerome in. What's the role of a local MP in these sorts of discussions, Jerome? And sort of how are you navigating these issues? Yeah, well, just on the, uh, on the policy uh, proposal before conference, I think, you know, like we all agree here, it's a really good start. Um, there's no mention of regenerative AI or a, a generative AI in, in the platform. And getting a broad uh, policy position uh, gives the parliamentary party the authority to pursue it further, and that's really important in, you know, how our party operates, uh, particularly when in government. Um, I've got a pretty unique circumstance as a local MP, uh, given that um, uh, I have the largest amount of tech workers that live uh, in my electorate. Silicon Alley! Pill Hill and Silicon Valley in Macquarie Park. 
Uh, so I'm right in there. One of um, our, you know our local businesses uses uh, AI uh, in endoscopies, um, which increases the amount of um, detectability by about 50%. Um, you've then got you know all the research laboratories that use AI on a regular basis, um, and you know as Ed mentioned, they're calling out for reform as well. So I think. Um, you know, while some may say Australia's behind on, um, on regulation, that does give us the opportunity to explore what um, the Europeans have done, explore what the Americans have done and what the Chinese have done in the space, mm. uh, tailor something that works here in Australia. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you said, it needs, you can't talk about AI without talking about privacy um, uh, because it's, it's data that makes AI work. And um, you know, it's we've we've only seen what mm. happens when our privacy laws, which haven't been looked at in about forty years, aren't up to scratch. So um, that might be a good segue. You've just segued into um, the article that Ed and his colleagues from HTI put up in the conversation over the last week um, around that very point that if you regulate AI without privacy reform, it's really on very shaky sand. It's not they're not firm foundations. Do you want to talk a bit about that, Ed? Yeah, so um, it's almost a cliche now to describe data, your personal information is the new oil, right? Like it's the thing that is being exploited. AI doesn't work um, without people's personal information. And so I guess we've got a choice, right? Do we, do we want to just have a free for all um, where we are being exploited? We are the things who are being mined. Um, or do we want to put some um, firmer boundaries about, around what is permissible and what's not permissible. I think that's a really easy choice, um, but it's not a consequence-free choice, right? We've uh, had eight major reviews over the last uh, just over 15 years um, in, in the privacy law area, and they've all said basically the same thing. We need to modernise the law. We need some really clear reforms. We need to tighten the law, um, and we still need to support innovation. Um, but no government has been able to actually act on um, any of those reforms. Um, and so the problem is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a bit like, you know, the music has stopped now, Labor is in power. Labor has to do something about this now. Um, you know, it, the Attorney General's own department um, did a major review uh, the report can't, was, was made public at the start of this year. Um, again, it has those same sensible reforms we've seen over and over again. We've got to put those reforms in place. Otherwise, Australians are, are, are really unprotected. I feel like you're lobbying one of the, um, the Labor members to take this forward. But um, do you want to give people a bit of a, a background on the history yeah. of privacy as a concept? Because I wasn't aware of this. It goes back to the, the Holocaust, right? Yeah. It, it was actually a really direct response to the Holocaust. Um, so our modern privacy law um, was, was predicated on this idea that the Nazis um, were able to um, hold, collect and hold all of this um, really sensitive personal information, um, not just about Jewish people like me, but about many other people that they persecuted. And uh, there was this quite radical idea uh, at the end of the Second World War which was that sometimes ignorance is better than all of that knowledge about people's personal information. Sometimes just literally not having that personal information um, in the hands of, of powerful governments is better. That, that is essentially what privacy law is. It is a defense of a limited form of ignorance because um, the consequences can be so catastrophic where personal information is just kind of a free for all. And so um, what privacy law tries to do is to set some boundaries that had never previously been, been set. Um, and uh, I guess what we, we have in Australia um, is a law that was basically written in the 1980s before the rise of the internet, as, as mm. Jerome referred to a moment ago. Uh, and there have been some tinkering around the edges, but it needs to be modernised. So, so, Lizzie, the inflection point really was the big... The, the big other big global event of our, our generation, which was 9-11, which changed the way governments treated people's personal information because all of a sudden there were new tools that could keep us safe. Yeah, I think that question around safety, what's the state's responsibility to keep you safe and how far can it go to uphold that value uh, is a discussion that uh, we've been having in a renewed format since 2001. Australia, of course, has a bit of a bad track record in this respect. We've been described as the world's most secretive democracy. I think we passed, you know, um, nearly 100 pieces of legislation in relation to surveillance, for example, or um, state powers in the wake of that terror 
terrorist attack. And I think in recent times we've seen a, um, a shift away from that discussion, probably since the Snowden revelations, where people were kind of appalled at the level of surveillance that was possible and that was actually being operationalised, uh, in partnership with private companies as well. And there's been a, a reset of sorts and I think and a growing recognition that there are legitimate ways in which people seek to protect their privacy, especially in a context where digital technology facilitates a greater insight than ever into how you think. Sometimes it knows you better than you know yourself, or at least that's how it feels like. Uh, and that there's a real um, need to, to draw a boundary around what's possible in, in the pursuit or in the name of that, that idea of safety. And I think we're increasingly seeing that people want to stop that. Like there was a survey that was put out um, just, to, I think, last week that was one that's routinely done by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, which includes the Privacy Commissioner, so they're largely responsible for this field. But it found that very, very high percentages, up in the 90s, of people want improved privacy protections. They see it as an important right. There's a narrative in, in public life now that people have given up on privacy because they've ticked the box, consent to everything. They let Facebook look at what they're doing all the time. Whereas, in fact, I think that's not true. Lots and lots of people do feel like they're entitled to the right to privacy. They want the government to do something about it. They want it to be protected. And I think that's a, a, a reasonable, rational position. It's very difficult now to move through life without companies knowing a huge amount about you. Drones just about to find that out. Uh, but what I would say <laughs> is that that doesn't mean that that is, is uh, inconsistent with holding true the idea that you're entitled to it, that there's an important role for privacy to play, that you understand that there may be social consequences with, with protecting that right, but that that's valuable. And, and I think that's where we're at. So what, can you talk me through, um, there's three real planks of the reforms that, in my limited brain space that can handle, which is definitions, consent, and enforceable rights. Do you just want to talk us briefly through those? And there's the special bit that I want to talk to Ed about after that. Yeah, like, so the definition of personal information, what's covered and what isn't covered by the Privacy Act, is, is written uh, in another time, really. It's not uh, really able to be uh, squared with how we understand personal information in the modern digital age. So updating those definitions, the idea... I mean, I'll go into this a little bit as well, because we're going to... Jerome's going to learn all about this in particular in an applied format. But um, there's also the idea that you can just consent to anything happening and that that's then justifiable how that data is used is, is, I think, no longer acceptable in the 21st century. So we need to change that contractual idea of privacy, that once you say yes to giving someone that, your data, that that can be used for any purpose whatsoever, uh, even beyond your comprehension. You know, that, that is not an appropriate way to regulate that transfer and that we need things like a fair and reasonable test and, and, and the like. And then the third one is what do you do when your privacy is interfered with. And at the moment, your only real option is to go to make a complaint to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, who I mentioned before. And there's a, a push or there's a recommendation um, around introducing a direct right to, to be able to go to court and pursue that directly, like you would in discrimination legislation, for example. So those are some of the big proposed changes. And then the last one, Ed, is the... Um particular um, red lines on high impact uses of technology. And before we get into your work on facial recognition technology, Ed shared with me something the other day that I didn't know that you said you were happy to share with the audience, that you actually have an issue with um, facial recognition. Yeah, I've got, I've got a very mild form of face blindness, <laughs> um, which is Incredibly embarrassing. Like I go through life, you know, seeing it's people. High mate, high yeah, that's right. Yeah, high 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 mate. it's good at an ALP conference. Exactly. Though, everyone thinks you're just being exactly. Normal. Not as good at the Liberal conference. So yeah. Um, yeah. No. No. Hundred percent. And so I, I'm the poster child of someone who would really like facial recognition. And you know what? There are plenty of good use cases for facial recognition technology. But even for someone like me, um, the rampant use of facial recognition without any uh, really effective regulation—that's a big problem. So tell us about some of the work you've been doing at HTI and how regulation would help you um, work with both industry and government to improve the guard or strengthen the guardrails around this. Yeah. So, I mean, I, a lot of people, myself included, probably use facial recognition on your phone to unlock your phone or you've maybe experienced it um, at the international border, that sort of thing. Those, those uses are relatively safe. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other uses um, that are much more prone to error and can lead to surveillance, uh, mass surveillance. So uh, when police, for example, use facial recognition, it's much, much more um, prone to error. And, and, and when they overuse it, that's where we start to move towards a mass surveillance state. Um, I mean, people often talk about China and the social credit scheme, which is truly dystopian. But you actually don't need to go to such a different kind of jurisdiction as China. If, if you go to London, there is literally um, 
for, for every 10 residents, there's more than one facial recognition enabled CCTV camera now in London. Um, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly inhibiting of people's behaviour. When, when the London Metropolitan Police did its first major trial of the use of facial recognition to identify um, criminal suspects, you know, the big headline that they put out there was that we identified 102 people that we hadn't previously been able to identify who were suspected of committing crime. Um, but it took an FOI application from the independent newspaper mm. to, to show that of those 102 people who were identified, 98 were wrongly identified, <laughs> right? So huge rates of error. Um, and the errors are much more uh, frequent uh, when it comes to people of colour, to women, uh, people with physical disability, very young people, very old people, basically anyone who does not look like Jerome, myself, or Peter. <laughs> um, so if you're a white middle-aged yeah. man, you're doing pretty well. Everybody else is subjected to much higher rates of error. Um, that, that's, that's really, really worrisome. But even if that was perfectly accurate, I don't think anyone wants to move to a mass surveillance state. So that's why we think um, well, we, we've, we've uh, come up with a, a model law, which we're working with the government on, um, which would uh, set much clearer boundaries. So show what is good, positive innovation, um, and then uh, set some boundaries around the kind of use of facial recognition that we think is harmful. So, so privacy law seems like a no-brainer, right? Like, one of the problems is that um, there are a couple of pretty powerful interests that are lining up against it. And traditionally, media has been against it because they wanted to do their whole snooping on celebrity sort of stuff. But the, the media opposition has shifted because a lot of them now think of themselves much more as data businesses and they don't want the constraints at the same time as big tech. So we've got big tech and big media both kind of running this passive aggressive no that is slowing down the passage of bills. I don't, I don't want you to tell tales out of school, Jerome, but have any of these sort of businesses been talking to people like you about their their concerns around privacy reform or no, they they're not speaking. that well organised? No, no. Well, you're not important enough. No, that's, that's, <laughs> well, maybe, maybe all of those. Yeah. Um, but no, I could, they haven't spoken to me about it, um, but you know, we're pretty aware um, of the deficiencies in our, in our current uh, rules yeah. and regulations in this space. And I've got no reason to disbelieve that in this term of government, we won't put a proposal to the parliament, uh, which will first go through our labour internal processes mm. um, for vetting first. Um, you know, I would, you know, particularly given some of the massive data breaches we've seen, yeah. uh, Optus and Medibank, um, that there's, there's an appetite in amongst yeah. our community for um, an update of these laws and to make sure that, that firms that do breach them um, are, are held accountable. And I guess, I guess that's sort of um, something in this space that's, that's really difficult for governments across the world to um, to deal with is that um, you know where we where the data is stored in Australia, where we have that sovereign capability to store it here, we can then regulate it a lot better. But as we know, with a lot of cloud services and where we store our data, most of the time it's not mm. actually stored here. So, is there a space for government to say certain types of data must be stored here in Australia, mm. uh, so that um, we have uh, full regulatory responsibility mm. over it? Um, sovereign data capabilities is an area that also needs to be discussed as, as we mm. delve through um, uh, um, AI being used and more, more of our personal mm. data being used. Lizzie, the other, the other um, bit in the laws is the proposed exemptions, which include small business, media and political parties. Yeah, I think that it's going to be very difficult to get rid of that political party <laughs> exemption because you're... You guys know Electrack. <laughs> It's um, it's it's too Not clean. it's too hard to um, get politicians to vote against their own interests, which you know whatever. But some of the other exemptions, I think, are a little out of date. You know, the small business one was supposed to be um, uh, temporary to allow businesses to get uh, on board with the changes that were proposed before removing it. And I think one thing that we have to be careful about with small business, I understand the costs of compliance can be high, but partly I also think. They should be entitled to be sold products that are actually of a high standard. And until you elevate the, the requirements upon them to bring them within the Privacy Act, I think they, we're going to see continuously substandard products in the marketplace for small businesses to use, which is not good. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of um, scandals recently about rental uh, agencies, real estate agents, for example, um, having very loose cyber security. That's an enormous problem because renters often have to provide vast amounts of very personal information. 
uh, in for the purposes of making an application to rent. I think this is un unacceptable on one level uh, as it is. But then if you can't trust that those companies will be subject to the Privacy Act, there's very few incentives to make sure that's properly protected. Uh, and I think we're really failing people who um, are kind of forced into this process because they're renters. Uh, there's increasingly interest in this. There's lots of uh, inquiries into these kinds of questions, particularly the rights of renters all around the country. Actually, there's a federal one. We've provided submissions on rent tech to South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales. So there's increasing interest in improving the experience of renters, for example. But a lot of these are small businesses excluded from the Privacy Act. And I think you do have to question the utility of that exemption because I think it serves the businesses poorly. And I think obviously lots of Australian citizens are affected mm. by the consequences of that exemption. So Ed, you've been, um, you're a graduate of the Boulevard of broken dreams on privacy reform, you've probably sort of ridden it more than most. Why is this time going to be different or will it be different? Um, look, I've, I think I'm burnt enough to say that I'm not confident that it will be different. It, it needs to be. Um, every failure of the last seven processes to modernise the law comes with consequences. And it's, it's real people who are affected. Like, you know, you, you mentioned data breaches before. If you, you know, have your... <laughs> be doing it again in a sec. Yeah, you? yeah, exactly. No, I mean, if you, if you have your personal information taken, you can, you know, be the victim of, of identity um, theft. It's, it's horrible. And it can happen again and again and again. Um, but with new technology, it gets even worse. So, you, you know, the, the hassle of having to get a new um, passport or a new driver's licence, that, that, that's really, really serious. But if we're talking about a facial recognition system that got hacked, mm. right, um, that's your biometric information. You can't get a new face. Um, and again, not a theoretical well, risk. technically, like, you can get it some enhancements. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. That might not be enough. Yes. Um, I mean, your beard, for example, it's, <laughs> it's a, a great enhancement um, for the people listening in. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't quite, you know, give you a new face entirely. So that um, the example uh, that I was going to refer to was from the United States, which is one of the major... Um, facial recognition systems that the Department of Homeland Security runs at the border with Mexico, um, that system was hacked. Um, and, you know, a couple of hundred thousand people's biometric information was accessed. What do you do now? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, that is incredibly worrisome. So unless you've got effective law, um, you're not doing everything you can to protect the community. Great. Um, and at the end, we're going to have a bit of a talk about some of the work going on to land this. Yep. But it's time now for our, um, what are we calling this? The, I think it's called the live, the live column. hack. Now oh, firstly, okay. Jerome, thank you very much for participating in this. And Jerome is not given... Lizzie his phone at all but do you want to set up yeah. the process and then we will sort of take you through some of the things that an average everyday very successful person who's an MP um, <laughs> can still leave behind. Go. Yeah, so I like to call this Jerome Luxale this is your life in iPhone oh. data um, you know so Ed was talking about data being the new oil to be monetized people talk about it being the new nuclear waste which is means it's to be managed I saw someone referring to data as the new bacon to be chewed up for insights. Um, <laughs> found that a bit offensive as a vegetarian. And then also as the new ocean into which we can deep dive. And I think it's fair to say that all of these metaphors really break down after a while. Um, but the lesson is there's a huge amount of personal information out there. It's been collected, analysed and, and stored for the purposes of monetization and uh, being used for surveillance. And, and I think we don't just don't know how often this is occurring and the scale um, for which it does. And in recent times, I've really been floating in an oily ocean of bacon with a flavour of Jerome. Um, I've spent a lot of time poking around in... Well, I was about to say poking around inside... Poking around to, inside his digital footprint. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been really kind enough to let us and some of my very helpful colleagues, I should say, Digital Rights Watch, um, do a bit of snooping on him and let us make him a subject of this. And to be clear, he hasn't been told anything about this, uh, but I have not touched his phone. I don't know any of his passwords or anything like that. Um, 
The idea of today is to just use Jerome as a a willing example (laughs) to highlight how much personal information is out there, how it can be used in various ways to influence us, to manipulate us, and why we really do need um, somebody to stand in and protect us because it can be used against our own interests. And so in the end, what I'm hoping we'll achieve is that everybody will agree we need to implement a fair and reasonable test that limits what information companies can hold about us rather than allowing these kinds of business models that are data-centric. We need improvements to our privacy laws. It's not simply enough to apply sticks to bad behaviour. We need carrots for good behaviour as well. And then also that uh, we need a right to deletion. Um, (laughs) That information about us at the moment can really be held indefinitely. And I think Jerome would agree that that's not always a good idea. Just before you start, Lizzie, can I just encourage you to keep the intro going a little bit longer oh, sure. because I'm enjoying the anxiety right now. <laughs> 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 you can smell it. Yeah. It's not bacon I can smell, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, let's start then. Um, <laughs> I'm enjoying it. For, uh, well, I mean, uh, look, I can talk to you more about privacy. Uh, no, yeah, well, I think, yeah, the, the micro-targeting that is possible currently uh, through the huge amounts of information and then when they cross-reference with each other is kind of astonishing. Uh, and, you know, there's plenty of examples about this in the wild and um, we'll talk a little bit about this, but Jerome, Jerome's done pretty well, I think, and I, I think I'd know who to who sell his data to for the purposes of marketing. But first up, Jerome, sad trombone. It looks like your personal information has been lost by a number of data breaches. So I'll just start with that. Your personal website email address, the one that most probably constituents use, that's only been lost in one data breach. I think that's pretty good. Um, but we also found another another email address that your chief of staff didn't know about. I found that, and um, turns out that's been caught up in about sixteen data breaches. I'm very sorry to say. So. Um, one of them was a non-profit, so good work you, you're a good citizen, but um, unfortunately we've paid a price for that. But we've got your uh, name, address, date of birth, passwords, job profiles, uh, didn't quite get your full credit card number, but a bit of it. The companies involved include me, music streaming services, professional networking, I'm not surprised by that, booking <laughs> services, a non-profit as I mentioned, design websites, and a lot of fitness apps, Jerome. Okay. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, can tell. Uh, I don't want to name them all in the interest of obviously respecting your privacy, okay. um, but I will name Canva because I bet your core flutes were absolutely beautiful, <laughs> but I think your price that you paid for that was probably a bit too high, so <laughs> you do need to change your password. I'll just put change that out there. Password. Okay. Uh, so I would say the reality of data breaches, 16 is pretty bad, I have to say, but uh, the reality is that they are increasingly common and they are increasingly affecting large, well-resourced companies. So there were 497 notifiable data breaches in Australia last year, although I should say a lot of germs were overseas, so he's not um, necessarily patronising Australian businesses, but you'll get there. Uh, but that's up uh, 26% from the previous year. So this is growing year on year. Um, you know, an obligation of data minimisation is one of the key ways in which we limit the impact of these kinds of major data breaching, it would, it would stop, um, I think, the incentive for criminal hacking, but it would also mean that the consequences for people like Jerome are less, are less devastating. Um, but uh, another sad trombone for Jerome. I hear that you're unfortunately the recipient of a notification that your data was compromised by Optus. That's yeah. a bit of a shame. Yeah, and to be fair, you told me that um, on the phone, but I actually would have known that anyway because he, Jerome just sold his... Um, second modem that Optus sent him. I saw it on Facebook Marketplace, 50 bucks. Yep. We got? Yeah, so, um, so I know then that your data from Optus is on the dark web. Thank you for telling me that. Um, yeah, so Telco Metadata, I do want to talk a little bit about that. So people may know that uh, currently under the metadata retention laws, everyone's metadata has to be held for three years by telcos. It was opposed to that law. That was one of the founding reasons for Digital Rights Watch to oppose that retention regime. It's pretty... Um, it's pretty egregious because this is not common around the rest of the world. It's, I think, one of the longest periods. And um, it means that uh, it was, well, it was designed to be introduced for the most serious of offences. That's what we were told. Only small numbers of agencies could, could get it for very serious offences without a warrant, I'd say. And then, of course, what's happened is that vastly more agencies than originally planned are now accessing this data from the RSPCA to local councils. Love your dogs, Jerome, by the way. Um, but the good, news, the good news is that the federal government has committed to reform these laws so you can tell your bosses that's great Um, but that doesn't help you right here right now Jerome so I had a look through your metadata I firstly deduced that you owned a Tesla and I was pretty good about my detective skills I felt pretty good about that and then I realized that one of life's great certainties is that anyone who owns a Tesla tells everybody about it and that is true so then I was a bit disappointed because it didn't seem like such a great revelation although what I can say it does look like 
Jerome's having a bit of trouble with his Tesla and has to take it in to the service centre. And then um, I guess I, I, I cottoned on to one of, another one of life's great certainties. So can I wind back? Because yeah. this is huge. Yeah. How do you know that the Tesla's gone to the service centre? Oh, well, because I've seen Jerome calling them a few times. I assume that he's... Um, are, you ta- are you taking him for yeah, a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the other great, the other great life's great sentence is that Elon Musk makes makes a bad businessman, so um, his products aren't that good. So I think Teslas have to go in pretty quickly. I mean, I think I would have... I, I didn't spend... I didn't review all of Jerome's social media accounts because, to be honest with you, there's quite a lot of content there. <laughs> <laughs> but I probably could have matched it with, the, with, his, with his trip there. He may have... Um, he may have, we've got a map that's coming later. Um, but, yeah, so that was... That would seem like an easy one to me. But... Um, I did want to. I did want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the telco data because the other thing I know is you got a trip to the dentist plan, right? I hope that's working out okay. I missed it. Oh, hmm. Jerome. It. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you can you can fix that up. I did want to talk a bit about health data actually because Jerome, it looks like you're quite the runner. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. So it seems like you're on with your kids sometimes. That's nice. Yeah. I, I won't name the, your kids even though I know what they look like and how old <laughs> they are. Um, and you seem to favor, favor Meadowbank Park and Lane Cove National Park for bike rides, right? Mm-hmm. Um, less so these days now you're spending more time in Canberra. Um, indeed, I saw that you sold your Camelback water bottle on Facebook, Mike Blake. So it looks like the marathon dreams are out of the question. Yeah. <laughs> no more marathons? Oh, that's a shame. I've done two if you want to talk about it. But, um, yeah, but what I would say is that it looked like you were on holiday in the New Year period around Jervis Bay. Is that right? Yeah, okay. You did a run there. I only knew that because you did a run there because I thought I will check the socials to see if he's already told everybody that. All I saw was some very serious tan lines that you got because you didn't slip, slop, slap, but I didn't know where. (laughs) And so then I was grateful that you took a run because I could tell where you'd gone on holiday. Now, have they faded? The tan line, yeah, they're gone. Oh, gosh. There's no sun in camera. No. (laughs) That definitely had to come from Jervis Bay. What I would say about health data is that it is incredibly valuable to a number of different industries. And when I say that, I include health data from like fitness apps, but also things like pharmacy loyalty schemes and the like. Uh, obviously, the industry that's interested in that is insurance, uh, and it's pretty frustrating, I think, if you just want to track your run on a free app like Jerome does, uh, that then that can be used to tell you your health insurance premiums. And I wonder if, if your health insurer does know about your struggles with squeezing in runs these days, because it looks like you're running a bit less now you're a fancy member of Parliament, am I right? Running less, yeah. Yeah, it's cold in Canberra. Yeah. Only 11 runs this year, Jerome. What are you doing? <laughs> Not many runs. But you are doing a bit more hit inside. Correct. Yeah, okay, well, I'll know where to find you next time you're doing a hit. Um, <laughs> now, at the moment, these kinds of tra- transactions, when we share our health, health data, it's usually facilitated by tick a box consent, tick a box consent, right? Yeah, that's what you did. And even if I think you wanted to be really careful about who that was shared with, you don't really have any control about it at all. Like Jerome's, um, you know, happy to share that with everybody for, probably for a bit of bragging until he realises his runs there on the downward trajectory. But um, what I would say is that if you put your data into Fitbit, you'd be pretty miffed that that was then sold to Google, who then is acquiring huge amounts of health information from uh, hospitals and other kind of service providers and that that could be matched. Uh, so I think there's a real need to regulate how information like this can change hands uh, and that you need a right to... to for this data only to be used for what's fair and reasonable for the purpose for which you shared it, which is one of the, the proposed mm. reforms in the Privacy Act. So I did want to do It goes with, on. Yeah. So Keep going. Do, okay. This is awesome. So yeah. personal information, um, it is really woefully out of date. So uh, it, for example, doesn't include any loco- locational information. That's not even considered by the Privacy Act. So locational mm. information is in fact very, very, very revealing. And we've got a great map. I've shared it with Jerome and, and these guys. I don't know whether you've had a look, but it's all colour coded. It's lovely. And it's based on all Jerome's postings, where he's been. I mean, ride. He loves ride. That's great. Bit of Canberra. Went to Amy Stadium. Had a good time. You're a soccer mm-hmm. fan. None, Jervis Bay wasn't on there, which I don't know. But anyway, he tried to keep that on the download. Um, but yeah, the, it, it shows you where he's been, his patterns. I can see where all of his lovely family have been um, by cross-referencing them because it's not even just Jerome, it's his lovely partner. Um, and that means that I think it's really possible for this rich data source to be targeted, to be used for micro-targeting and advertising. And that may not be a, a huge concern for his beautiful family, but it may be for others, for example. And I want to talk a little bit about that because... Jerome may not be the target of this, but, you know, lots of, of apps that people use, like weather apps, um, for example, share locational information about you for other purposes all the time. They, they parcel it up and sell it on to other um, data brokers. 
And I think it's really interesting. According to Vice, for example, in the US, it costs over $160 to get a week's worth of data where people, um, oh, for people who may have visited Planned Parenthood, where they came from and where they went afterwards. Uh, and in 2016, an advertising CEO who worked with an anti-abortion and Christian group actually was sending targeted advertisements to women sitting in Planned Parenthood clinics in an attempt to change their mind about getting an abortion. So this is hugely important information that tells a lot about you as a person um, and your family, people who you travel with. And at the moment, it's completely unregulated uh, by the Privacy Act because the definition of personal information doesn't include a locational element. Now, Jerome doesn't need to be concerned about Roe versus Wade in this context, which is great, um, but the point still stands that it's incredibly rich um, and you can't personally control it. So everybody who posts with you, um, including for Jerome, a lot of constituents, may, they, the data can be inferred about where you've been from that data and there's almost nothing you can do about it. Uh, and I really wanted to emphasise this point, that you can learn a lot about a person, uh, even if they themselves are extremely careful about their, what they share. And that is not Jerome, I'll just put it out there. But um, what I would say is uh, he's, he absolutely loves to post, that's fine. I think that's completely his right. But, um, you know, he's very careful about his kids and his dogs, for example, which I think is also very reasonable. But you may not always be able to control that. And Jerome can't always control what other people share. So I'm sure he's thrilled that his dog trainer shared quite a bit of personal information about his dogs and the trouble he's facing with them. So Toby's been giving your carpet a bit of trouble, has he? He has. Oh, he and he has. can't, can't yeah, make it through the doggy dog. He's doggy dog trainer in to sort it out. <laughs> yeah, she's a big poster too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know, they, they post, she talked about his fantastic parents in Sydney. She's very discreet, but then, of course, it's immediately obvious who it is. And um, no more grazing for Toby then. No, no more meals got to be taken away at the end. Time. Tough yeah. regime. Could um, a lot from it. Now, if I was Toby, <laughs> I'd be a little bit miffed that that was all online because the photo of him is just very sad, sad for Toby. He just looks like he's being slightly humiliated. Toby's a dog? Yes. yes. <laughs> he's a foxy. Yeah. I know, and if you look at Jerome's feed, Toby's presenting in a lovely light. It's really like his highlights reel. It's like his real Instagram moment. But then when you look at the dog training, you think, oh, there's a lot more to Toby's life. And he's just kind of working it out. And I'm not saying um, you would necessarily, but if you felt that was an interference with your privacy and you were Toby, for example, um, if someone shares information without your consent, you, you have not that much you, you can do about that at present. Your only real recourse is to go to the Privacy Commissioner and make a complaint, but you can't go to court, like I mentioned before. You can't, you know, if you were the victim of a mass data breach, and Jerome being one of those people, you can't necessarily go to court and directly sue for compensation. That's a problem. So I do think we need to fix that, give people a direct right of action. Because even if you're very careful about what you do, uh, you can't control what others do and that's a problem. Um, so the last, qu last question I've got for the panel is, Jerome has signed up for Duolingo. He's a dedicated student of Mandarin. Does anybody want to guess how many lessons he's taken? <laughs> Anybody want to guess? Throw out a number there. On Duolingo? Two, two. Anyone else? On Duolingo? Yes, on Duolingo. Okay. Anyone else? Three. Yeah. Three? Does anyone want to guess zero? Yeah. <laughs> well done, Jerome. Well, my um, diary manager knows how many real lessons I've had, but Duolingo, no. Yeah. Oh, and he has to squeeze that in. Yeah. You know, it's a lot more than teensy bit embarrassed about his absence in Mandarin. Okay, if you can say how many lessons you've taken in Mandarin in Mandarin, then I'll, I'll let you off the hook. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, so I just wanted to give you an idea of the kinds of public information that I could discern from um, Jerome's phone. Uh, you know, I would not take this as an encouragement to not share or to lock down all your information, but more as an encouragement to advocate for privacy reform. Because Jerome's, a, you know, um, a capable person who's in a good situation, is a high profile guy. But if you were a victim of domestic violence who didn't necessarily want everyone knowing where you were at all times, you were seeking very personal reproductive health care, or uh, for any other reason, you just want to be able to move through the world without being scrutinised at all times by advertisers. I think you've got a very legitimate concern. Mm. I think you ought to have a very legitimate concern with the state of our privacy laws who that currently do not facilitate that at all. Wow. Hey, Lizzie, like often I forget that we, we just talk like we're talking about stuff and I forget you're a lawyer, but you took a brief and you've delivered that hugely. So thanks to you and Digital Rights no Watch. Yes, that was amazing. Um, but Jerome, is there anything in there that makes you, like, obviously... Are you going to delete all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel about that? Was that what you were expecting? Is it, does it go further than you thought? Like, oh, look, I think it goes a little bit further. I think um, the third-party information was, was a bit eye-opening, so the fact that you found out a bit of information about my dog, whilst that example was pretty benign, I can imagine if someone else is sharing stuff about you 
that you don't necessarily want them to, and, and that can be linked. Um, the geolocating also is quite concerning. Um, but yeah, it's a, a good eye opener, and thanks for not ruining my career. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, what do you think when you think that that much on most citizens is out there? Like, why should we be concerned? Well, I mean, I think some of the discussions about privacy just Because, you know, a lot of it is just, I, I don't care anymore. Like, it's all yeah, out yeah. there, so why stop? Well, that's right. So, and, and some of the discussions about privacy are, are really either defeatist, um, which is the argument you just made, and, and even then, if you, it's, it's a bit like climate change, right? There is a material difference between a two-degree warming, warming of temperatures and a three-degree warming. In te- like, we, we should minimise the, the scope of that problem, if, even if we can't absolutely address it. But the other, the other point that really, I think, was driven home by that is that privacy can feel like the most abstract human right. I know that as, you know, a human rights lawyer myself. Like, you know, if you're talking about discrimination, people get that immediately. Whereas privacy, often people sort of say, oh, gosh, you know, is that something that, you know, if you're doing the wrong thing, then you might be um, worried about it. Mm. But I think what this shows is even if all of the activities that are being described are innocuous, and, and, and they were, I hasten to say. Um, it is still not just uncomfortable, it's really, really awful mm. to have that level of scrutiny. And if you think, you know, there's um, not just benign actors out there wanting to exploit that information, um, that's, that's hugely yeah. worrying. Yeah, like there's use and then there's capability. It's the yeah. capability bit that would concern me that a bad faith actor... Mm with the ability to do what anyone can do <laughs> with a little bit of knowledge at the yeah. moment could do real damage. I mean, you know, going back earlier in my career, you know, worked with the victims of domestic violence who've had their personal information um, leach into the public domain. It's been exploited by a former partner, some a, abusive former partner. Um, you can imagine how catastrophic mm. that could be um, and so, so we, I think we have to take it seriously. It's, it's easy to sort of make jokes about it and so on. We should, by all means, do that, but we should also take it really seriously. I mean, the, the other component as well is if you think about something like the voice referendum, there's a huge capacity to generate quite tailored advertisements as to why, for example, you should vote no based on what they think your interests are. And that would normally not happen in previous elections previous kinds, I mean, this is not an election, but previous moments in which people all vote. This is not a common experience. But it now, that now occurs below the radar. People cannot see it. It's very difficult to contend with. At the moment, some of the key no organisations are outspending the Yes campaign by significant sum. And using generative AI, not just yeah. to deliver a message, but to get into... Um, the comment section on posts and things, totally. right? Totally. And also, I mean, this is also happens outside of these environments by predatory industries like gambling, like alcohol. Mm. This is now well documented. They create curated advertisements. So, like, the, even the design is specific to you. And then how they identify the audience, they use this kind of cross-referencing cross, uh, of various data sets to give you the exact ad that's most likely to work for you. And at the moment, that really damages our democracy as well as, obviously, is being mm. used in predatory ways by, by companies that have have an interest in manipulating you and that's a big problem. So I wonder, just to round off this discussion, how do we approach this as progressives? So I think it's interesting going back to Labor's platform on AI, there is the bit we need to support industries to create jobs, we need to support workers through transition and we need to create some protections for the public. But that seems to me to be kind of the ticker box. What what should, and, and even the term progressive I sometimes struggle with because it, it, it in a way, is this more, we've got, to, we've got to embrace a bit of conservatism in the way that technology is developed. Absolutely. I think um, we can't let uh, AI or, or breaches in privacy erode away the rights that we fought for for so long. Like, we can't, in terms of lending and renting, we can't let AI... Uh, um, you know, exclude swathes of population who would either have, otherwise have rights uh, to be protected in rental applications or getting a loan or applying for a job. Um, uh, we need to be conservative in protecting what we fought for, uh, but I guess embrace the opportunities that these technologies provide us. And um, we've done okay with that, but there's, I guess, what's happening now so differently it is the speed at which some of this new technology comes in. Um, but, yeah, we can't give up what we fought for, I think, is how we do this in a progressive way. Let, let's talk, Ed, a bit about how 
we collectively are trying to you know, harness a bit of civil society to push around this? Like, who are the players in the ecosystem that give a damn and who needs to be brought into the ecosystem? I mean, I think um, there, there are very few civil society organisations like Digital Rights Watch who have really gone deep on this issue and, and really turned their minds to how, um, you know, the rise of new technology, it is causing fundamental threats to things that we really care about, right? Um, our ability to go through the world without having our rights exploited, that, that's really important. I, I think the Attorney General, whose portfolio this is, has been really explicit with um, their community. He, he's saying, well, look, you know, there are some very strong, powerful interests who are opposed to privacy reform and have been for a long time. If there's a groundswell of the population who actually cares about this. I need to see it, right? Um, and the government needs to see it. So they need to hear from civil society organisations, not just Digital Rights Watch, but, but others that, that, that care about you know, the public interest. And um, they it, it, yeah, need to speak very clearly that, that we need to modernise our laws and we need to improve those, those um, basic privacy and human rights protections. So choice has been really strong yeah. on coming up with some you know, amazing case studies. So if you're interested, look at, look at what choice is doing. There, is, there seems to be also a bit of a, a burgeoning um, movement around people representing children. And I know that yes. Digital Rights Watch has been putting together... Yes, that's right. um, a, a, an open letter. Yeah, we are. So yeah. if you are a parent that's interested in privacy reform, you're welcome to uh, sign our letter. Uh, this has kind of been spurred out of a uh, desire to kind of think quite critically about this blossoming tech sector in the education field, which often relies on parents being busy and uh, consenting to the sharing of information about their children. And a real requirement to kind of opt into these systems, you don't really have the capacity to opt out if, you're, if your kid's in a school. And, and these systems can be very invasive when they're collecting data about children that they can hold for the rest of their lives. And I think we owe our children an obligation to not permit this to continue and to, to fight for their right to be able to have a childhood that is free from surveillance. Um, and that we need to find other solutions that aren't just tech-based to some of the problems that we face in this field. You know, if there's real issues that can, uh, that technology can be used for successfully in an education setting, but I think it's reasonable to expect that the data that's held is treated differently and respects the rights of children. And, um, you know, there's a lot of parents who are quite concerned about that, which is a good thing, and we want to make their voice heard so that it's not just perceived as you know, um, white men in, in basements wearing tinfoil hats. This is actually an issue that affects lots and lots of different people in society and, um, you know, parents are an obvious example. You when you did that, I, you know, oh, no. I think it was to the two of you, right? Not me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You were just sitting I there aspire and you were to tinfoil. Yeah. Um, look, it seems to me that the last challenge is that there are so many urgent issues. There's climate change is an urgent issue. The voice this year is an urgent issue. Housing is an urgent issue. Um, dealing with racism, dealing with any form of discrimination is an urgent issue. And often something like this gets lost in the Chinese menu of, 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 of issues, whereas it really is foundational. Um, the rights of renters sits on privacy law. The future yep. of work sits on privacy law. Um, respect for conversations around the voice sit on around privacy reform. Coming up with a shared sense of truth around the greatest existential challenge we're facing, which is climate change, relies on that. So I guess the entreaty for, for everyone here today at the conference, but more in general for anyone that's interested in a more progressive society is this is kind of a battle we've got to win, right, Ed? And it's going to happen yeah. over the next six to 12 months. Um, and we're looking for friends in Canberra. I know with Jerome's on our side now after today, but we've got to really find a way of um, marking this as something that for the first time in 40 years is not put in a too hard basket. Mm. Well put. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's call it quits. Thanks, guys. Been a great, great having you in the room and thanks for being part of Burning Platforms. Which will be in the feed if we recorded it properly. Thanks, Lizzie. That was terrific. And thanks for being such a good sport, Jerome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers. You've been listening to Burning Platforms, a fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. It was recorded on August 18 and produced on Gadigal land by Jennifer Macy. Talk again soon. <laughs>